that was, I mean, this most extraordinary programme, first of all, fronted by Brian Edwards. It was 90 minutes of live television. Edwards was hugely creative in terms of, he was, in my opinion, one of the, he knew how to work a studio. And we were needing studio programmes because they were way cheaper than going out and shooting film. And so he just had so many fun ideas, really. And he had another one where he brought in a whole big, huge swimming pool and the lower hut fire brigade filled it up with foam and he erected a diving board above it and then politicians had to get up and tell a joke and you know then the audience voted on whether the joke was a go or it wasn't or and if it wasn't they used to they just got dumped off the diving board into the foam. I think Brian has softened astronomically you know over the years I mean he's in those days you know he was far more closed down than he is. He's opened up as a human being and and he um, I think he's become far more sensitive and softer as he has, has got older. You know, he wasn't a walk in the park to deal with, but I had enormous respect for him and he was incredibly creative and I learned heaps from him. When we went to South Africa and we ended up making three programmes, but because of the situation in South Africa, we were really doing research on the hoof and we were constantly monitored by the secret police. We learned very quickly, you know, we'd have to split up into groups and he would keep the secret police entertained and go and film some patsy thing they wanted him to film. Well, I would get ahead of the crew and go up to KwaZulu land and jack up interviews with Desmond Tutu or whoever it was. We had to learn to trust each other. We're a very, very small crew. If somebody had said to me in advance, I was quite young, I was still only about 26 or something, um, you're going to go to South Africa and you're going to travel all over this country, you know nobody and you're going to go and find all these people and interview them and I'd go, what? You know, <laughs> but when you're put under pressure, and I'm sure any journalist would tell you this, and you're suddenly in a war zone and the Sudan or wherever you are, you do do it. You do come up with something, you, you come up with some magic, you come up with inventiveness, you come up with the courage to deliver the goods. And that's what makes journalism exciting. So many journalists uh, lack gratitude for the opportunities we've had. And um, I mean, who else gets to interview just these people like Donald Woods was absolutely fantastic. Desmond Tutu, of course, is still alive. I interviewed Steve Biko. Donald Woods jacked up the opportunity for me to go and see Steve Biko, and it was a bit of a knock three times and ask for Alfie exercise. So, you know, you will drive your rental car down a, uh, you know, country road for 15 kilometres, stop at the church door, which will be coloured green, knock on the door three times, ask for Albert kind of idea. Albert will then put you in his car and take you up to this country hospital where you will meet Steve Biko. And it was just kind of, you know, right out there. And so eventually that's what happened. And I got up to this little country hospital where all these um, radical, African people were there. I guess today's world, they'd all be members of the ANC. Um, and there was about four journalists ahead of me in the queue to interview Steve, and eventually I got to interview him. And I got, I think, a whole hour with him, which was just exceptional. He was under, he was a banned person. All his books were banned, all his public speeches were banned. And had I been caught with his tapes or anything else then it would have fast forwarded to him. I mean, he ended up having a dreadful death anyway in custody, but he would have ended up being taken immediately into custody and beaten up and things. So, but I actually drove him home to his house, which was just amazing. And I can remember dropping him off in his house and there was this massive African moon, just sort of sitting up in this black sky and this extraordinarily charismatic man standing underneath it and thinking, you know, this is sort of a moment of gold in my life. I think it was uh, Michael Parkinson said people who front television shows are divided between those who succeed because of their ego and it's largely all about them and those that genuinely love people. And 
and Ian Johnson loves people. He, he was just get excited talking to some guy who was a possum farmer on the west coast as he would get excited talking to the president in South Africa. And he was charming, funny, um, and he, he, he had a, a sort of a music and a grace about him that was just fabulous to work with. He's a master of script writing and a master of the piece to camera. And the eloquence of his pieces to camera was just absolutely brilliant. So it was just enormous fun to work with and, and I was able to really bring a bit of grunt to, to things, you know, it sometimes wasn't, we didn't have the greatest clarity on what the programme in hand was about and I always had a reputation for being a bit of a, a bit of a bossy boots about that. <laughs> I just loved that period of my life. We'd be down in the South Island filming, the snow would be on the Southern Alps, we'd have fabulous interview subjects and I used to sometimes think, boy, is someone going to send me an invoice, you know, <laughs> at some point because it was such a magic way to earn a living. Richard Thomas had come from Britain and he'd become our boss and he'd come away on a film shoots with us to the South Island and seen us in operation. And, and he came back from doing the series and he'd formed the view that Ian and I should be parted. And not because we weren't great together, but because he thought Ian could be bringing through more research talent and I could be moving on into producing. And I was a bit put out about this. <laughs> In fact, I felt like somebody had sent me the divorce papers or something, you know. And, uh, but I did get the point and I was very grateful for him believing in me. I think we're trying to look at sexuality within the context of a life. It was actually talking about everything that goes to how are we sexual people. You know, there was even a discussion about how is it that people who don't feel very strongly sexual, um, how do we get intimacy, how do we get affection between us, what keeps couples together, what gets them together, what are the, how is it different when you're a teenager from when you are a single person? The philosophy of developing the series, the process, was very important to me. And so basically the idea was that we would have a single person did the singles programs, a young person did the young program, an older person did the old age program. That was important, so that was the first thing. The second thing was that because we were dealing with a lot of stuff around intimacy, you had to be able to talk about sex. You couldn't just fudge around and talk about it. And you had to be able to understand that people were telling you stuff that was very precious and perhaps they'd never talked about it before. So you had to actually have some good interview process. And so I put all of the people that worked on the show through a two-day training course. There was a book to go with it. And after it was finished, we sent the programs to Auckland to be approved by the then controller of programs, a guy called Barry Parkin. And then there was just this massive hiatus for a while. We heard nothing. They were scared and challenged by the content of the show. There was a lot of new territory covered. And so what happened was that basically there was a lot of indecision making. They sat on the program for about 18 months until they put it to air. Having a program with fathers holding their babies, going to the birth, talking about all those issues, staying at home with their children was way out there. And through having more women come into television, we were starting to test the water and do these sorts of programs. Um, Pamela Meeking Stewart around that time did Pioneer Women. I, she, co she was my executive producer. We went on to do the whole of the sexuality series, which, you know, while it might have some seem a bit old fashioned in some ways now, that was really out there. Talking, you know, to gay women, to and men, talking to older people about their sex life. I mean, that was completely out there in the early eighties. And there were so many other things where having women that were conscious and were part of the feminist movement 
help drive change, not only in content, but in the kind of jobs that we would go on to do. And I think it led to a prof the need for professionalism. You know, so we weren't just stuck with a glass ceiling around being researchers, but that we could go on with and develop as directors, producers. Mm -hmm.